Hello, and welcome to the Your Active Debate. I'm Dave Keating, and today we're going to be talking about EU-Kazakhstan relations following that country's presidential election earlier this month. It marks a turning point for the country. After Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, Kazakhstan's president since independence from the Soviet Union three decades ago, stepped down. But there is an active debate about whether his successor, Kasim Jomer Tokayev, represents a new era or more of the same. We'll explore what's next for this Central Asian country with experts and diplomats both here in Brussels and, remotely, via satellite in Kazakhstan. Here with me in the studio we have Boris Irochevich, Head of Division for Central Asia at the European External Action Service, which is the EU's foreign policy arm, and Samuel Doveri Vesterby, Managing Director of the European Neighborhood Council, a Brussels-based independent think tank. Joining us remotely via satellite, we have Syaset Nurbek, Head of Education Products at BTS Digital, a private company in Kazakhstan, and also an independent expert on Kazakhstan politics. Thank you, gentlemen, so much for joining us for this discussion. Samuel, let's start with you. You actually traveled to Kazakhstan as an election observer uh, for that election on June 9th. Now, in that election, uh, President Tokayev won 71% of the vote facing off against six other government-approved candidates. Uh, now, there were some demonstrations after the election from people who were not happy with how the election was run, and it did come in for some criticism from the OSCE. So from your perspective, having been there on the ground, would you say that these were free and fair elections? Um, so I think what's important to bear in mind is when you look at a country like uh, Kazakhstan is, of course, that you have the, uh, what you mentioned before, the OSC uh, present from a long-term perspective, and then you also have some present from a short-term perspective. And you have to think about it as if uh, the long-term perspective of observers take kind of a, an analysis of the country from the media environment, from the judiciary, um, how free and fair are the courts, um, you know, all, all these kind of long-term factors which influence whether or not you have a transparent, accountable uh, democracy. So that's their job on the long term. Um, then on the short term, you have election observers also from OSCE um, under ODIR, um, by the way, of which Kazakhstan is a member as well. And what they do is they, they look at, at the immediate timing of the election within a few days uh, span before or after, and they take kind of a, a snapshot and they go with very technical uh, guidelines on whether or not there's been ballot stuffing, whether or not there have been major irregularities, whether counting, tabulation has gone uh, fairly. And I think maybe what's most important when you look at these elections in Kazakhstan is that um, it was obvious that there were some uh, difficulties and irregularities from the OSCE report with regard to the long-term perspective, but it was also quite clear that, um, so for example, the media environment had some issues or, or uh, for example, permissions on protests and so forth could have been more liberal, could have been more open. Uh, but then from the short-term perspective, it was also obvious uh, that there was uh, a lot of uh, reasonably well done uh, election uh, management, coordination, uh, tabulation and so forth. There were also irregularities within the report, which is publicly available. But uh, I think there was a degree of progress which, which was seen, which was, which was a good thing. Now, Boris, you were, you know, when you're looking at the EU's relations with uh, Kazakhstan and now the new president, um, there, were, uh, some, there was some criticism, or at least um, if, uh, the High Representative for Foreign Affairs for the EU, Federica Mogherini, said these issues identified by the OSCE should be looked at. Um, by the government. So there's the, the issues of the actual election, but then of course there's the bigger picture about the transfer of power. And I think that's really what those protests were about. Um, the, the questioning in a lot of people's minds whether this is really a transfer of power or whether Nazarbayev will be still kind of pulling the strings. Um, how do you view this transfer of power? How do you think the transfer of power has been handled in Kazakhstan so far? Oh, we have first acknowledged that uh, transition, transfer of power is not easy in uh, 
regimes like uh, we know in Central Asia. Uh, we had uh, other examples uh, in, uh, in the region. Uh, so overall, I think in Kazakhstan, uh, it uh, went relatively peaceful. Uh, of course, uh, we know that uh, President Nazarbayev uh, stays uh, also uh, in power has become honorary president, is uh, chairing um, the Security Council. Uh, his daughter is uh, the speaker of, uh, of the Senate. Uh, but nevertheless, I think we, we see uh, this transition as a, as a first step, uh, which is uh, uh, probably a good example uh, for the region. Uh, and of course, the OEC uh, observation uh, uh, report uh, was uh, critical, but uh, we see it as a starting point. And uh, we are ready to work together with, uh, with Kazakhstan, I mean, to improve the next elections. So it's not perfect, um, but at least there were seven uh, candidates, uh, including one woman for the first time. Uh, one of the opposition candidates got a significant number of, um, of uh, votes. So uh, I think for us, uh, we see it uh, in the difficult uh, or in the regional context, we see it as a, as a good step forward. Samuel, when we're looking at the role of Nazarbayev now going forward, what do you expect will be his role in Kazakhstan politics going forward? Will it maintain this very strong level that it's at now, or do you expect a kind of dissipation over time? I mean, w the way in which I've been looking from a research perspective at Kazakhstan in recent uh, months and years, uh, especially leading up to the election, has been to try to understand, um, of course, because of the release of the European External Action Service's Central Asia strategy that I'm sure we'll touch on in a bit as well, try to understand what what is the potential that comes out of an electoral momentum and that comes out of a new relationship with um, an economic powerhouse like Europe? So within that context, what I think is important, what I'm trying to say is that within that context, whatever Tokayev does now, I think is very linked to that as well. Because if you look at uh, the, the situation of Kazakhstan from a, an economic perspective, what you very quickly realize is that it's a highly, highly resource-dependent country. It has a very little amount of diversification. Um, and of course, for anyone who has an economic background, you're immediately aware of the fact that you run into some uh, issues. Not issues for the European Union or for other countries, but issues for Kazakhstan and its people and its economy, which are things like having fluctuating oil prices and how that impacts your economy. If you look at just the last decade, there's been an enormous amount of oil price fluctuation for a country that depends, I think about 50% on, 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 on specifically on gas and then you and, and oil, and then you add another maybe 5% on ferroalloys, zinc, copper. I mean, we're talking about 80% resource-related dependency economy. That's an issue for Kazakhstan itself and for its, its currency as well and for its potential manufacturing sector or service sector or any other sector that it wishes to go into in the future. So why is this important within the context of the question you asked me about Tokayev and the future of the country? Well, it's vital because only through that perspective of the economy does Kazakhstan uh, develop better relations with other countries. Does Kazakhstan manage to develop its own governance system? Does Kazakhstan manage to democratize? Does Kazakhstan manage to increase its GDP per capita? And in that way, does man manage also to be in the first tier of economies? Um, so that's very important to put it in that economic perspective, which is um, something I've, I've tried to do in my recent research as well. And as you mentioned, this commodity dependency has been something identified as the government as, by the government as potentially problematic, particularly with the fluctuating <laughs> oil prices. I mean, at the same time, uh, the country does possess great wealth in terms of uh, both minerals and oil and gas. It ranks ninth uh, for proven oil reserves and second for uranium reserves. Sayasat, I mean, from a business perspective in Kazakhstan, how important is that connectivity for diversifying Kazakhstan's economy and also taking advantage of its location on trade routes, when you think about uh, China's Silk Road initiative, or even digital initiatives that could 
help in this effort to diversify the economy? How important are those things? Uh, well, the, the connectivity and especially increasing the transit potential, and I talked like rebuilding up higher value added chains of production along that transit routes is one of the key pillars of Kazakhstan economic platform. And the economic platform of, uh, of, of, our, of our second president, Tokayev, is built on succession. So we would just basically continue to focus on connectivity. And Belt and Road Initiative, that's the official name for One Belt, One Road Initiative, uh, coined by Chinese government, is now taking the momentum. Uh, I mean, despite the fact it's being highly criticized and discussed and debated, but the Chinese government is really fixed on that idea. Uh, uh, two years ago, a uh, year and a half ago, they've declared a huge, a massive investment package of $900 billion investing in Belt and Road Initiative, and bulk of this money which is be, uh, would be spread across the Eurasian continent. And Kazakhstan is key in this huge uh, infrastructure project. And you know how they call Kazakhstan, and in China, we've been talking to our Chinese uh, colleagues, uh, they have the One Belt, One Road uh, program, and they call Kazakhstan buckle in the belt, because it's right in the middle, and it kind of connects this logic of building this the logistic hub. So being buckle in the belt, we would have to be very cautious uh, of how to deal with these investments, and uh, as part of this infrastructure plan, a uh, majority of the, the, the roads are already being built. Now there's a huge connecting project uh, on border with China, the Horgos uh, Logistics Hub, uh, Customs and Logistics Hubs. Uh, and then uh, the huge logistics hub is built, built in, in the capital, in Nur Sultan, and then the, the next connecting dot would be a huge uh, uh, logistics hub in Moscow and Belarus, and then it just connects to Europe. So uh, it, it, it's a big project, I and mean, it, it will certainly take some time. Uh, we are certainly focused in, in implementing this project, at least our part of this uh, larger infrastructure plan. Uh, and our hopes, uh, given this opportunity, that Kazakhstan's uh, opportunity, given the, the number of, uh, the amount of investment uh, flowing through this project, build production hubs along the Belt and Road, uh, and overcome, diversify our economy, build this higher value added chain so that we could use uh, have a better use for this huge flow of goods and services flowing through our territory. So that's in a nutshell the, the, the vision to, 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 to be part of that larger infrastructure platform. Let's talk about EU-Kazakhstan relations. Boris, you mentioned this high-level uh, business uh, connection that's going to be launched. Um, now, obviously the EU is making up a huge part of Kazakhstan's trade right now, as I believe it's, it's over half in terms of, mm -hmm. uh, of exports, a lot of which is oil and gas. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, uh, the new president has said that his priority at first will be the immediate neighbors, Central Asia, and of course his first visit as interim president was to Moscow rather than to uh, the EU. So how do you view the EU's relations with Kazakhstan as it relates to Kazakhstan's relations with its closest neighbors in Central Asia, with Moscow, and with Beijing? We, we try to build a, a non-exclusive relationship with, uh, with all the countries uh, in Central Asia. As Samuel said, we just issued uh, a month and a half ago a new strategy on, on Central Asia, uh, which uh, updates the, one, uh, the first one, which was uh, uh, produced in 2007. Uh, so that's the frame of our relation with, uh, with uh, the five countries uh, which are part of Central Asia for us. Um, and um, we also built bilateral relations uh, with each of the countries. And uh, in the case of Kazakhstan, we have what we call an enhanced partnership and cooperation agreement. So it was already uh, back in 2015 when we signed it, it was a modernized agreement. Uh, uh, really uh, going uh, much further than the, the one which was uh, signed in the 90s uh, after the uh, fall or collapse of the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, so, uh, and we know at the same time that uh, Kazakhstan is a member of the Eurasian Economic Union, 
is member of the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So for us, uh, there is no uh, contradiction and all uh, agreements that we sign with Kazakhstan, with the others uh, in Central Asia, are um, uh, non-exclusive and should benefit everybody. And uh, on the contrary, I think it's good that uh, Kazakhstan uh, has this multi-vector uh, policy that it can sell uh, goods uh, in, in Russia, in the Eurasian Economic Union, it uh, can sell goods uh, in China, it can sell goods uh, in the EU. Uh, so uh, for us it's um, uh, it's uh, extremely important to, to keep this uh, non-exclusive or inclusive approach. Um, on the other hand, I think Kazakhstan has a big role to play in Central Asia. I mean, it's the richest country um, and uh, we have seen that uh, uh, he plays uh, a very important role in, in uh, coordinating and a little bit uh, uh, developing rather regional cooperation in Central Asia. I mean, uh, uh, as, as, as uh, the most, uh, let's say, economically advanced country has a specific uh, place and role in, in Central Asia. Uh, Kazakhstan is also uh, extremely active uh, in, in Afghanistan, which is uh, a challenge for the whole, uh, for the whole region. And um, there, I mean, uh, we are working on trilateral projects where uh, EU is working with Kazakhstan, but also with others, and with Afghanistan, I mean, to promote this uh, regional integration, regional cooperation, exchange of, uh, of, uh, of students, uh, business uh, contacts, and so on. And uh, also, as a member of the Eurasian Economic Union, Kazakhstan can also uh, play a role, let's say, kind of uh, uh, trying to build bridges with the European Union. So uh, I think we are very uh, conscious of the role that uh, Kazakhstan can play in the region, and we see absolutely no problem that uh, Kazakhstan is uh, engaged in other in other organizations, in other uh, agreements. Uh, we share a number of, the, of uh, same values. We are all members of the OECE, which was mentioned earlier. Uh, so uh, we, and we see that uh, this, uh, let's say, multi-vector uh, policy will continue under the next uh, president. Our new agreement should fully enter into force very soon. We have still only one member state to, to ratify it. And then we will be fully equipped to uh, develop further our relations uh, with Kazakhstan. We will have the regional uh, strategy covering the entire uh, region uh, and facilitating cooperation among the five countries. And we will have this uh, bilateral agreement um, uh, which will guide also our, our work with, uh, with Kazakhstan. Now, the election was an unforeseen development, and as you mentioned, it was a welcome first step in the EU's eyes. Would you say that the election um, fundamentally changes anything about the EU and Kazakhstan's relationship? No, at this stage, uh, not not yet, uh, I would say. Uh, of course, we, we followed the conclusions of the observation mission that there have been some... Uh, uh, some irregularities during the election day. Also, we were concerned, we will not hide it, by the arrests which uh, took place uh, after the election. About 4,000 people were arrested. But now we see that the uh, situation is normalizing. We also took note that uh, uh, violence was limited on the side of the police. I mean, that's, uh, that's also clear. Um, so, uh, so far, I think we, uh, we see uh, no uh, change to the worse in our relation. On the contrary, and I already mentioned the, uh, this high-level platform, long-awaited, which will take place tomorrow on the 28th of, uh, of June. I think that's, uh, that's a very good sign that uh, Kazakhstan uh, is, is keen to, to continue the relation and to deepen it. Samuel, the ECPA uh, that, that was agreed in 2015, it's still not that long ago. <coughs> Have we really felt the effects of the ECPA yet? And if so, how? Well, I, th I think it's maybe important to bear in mind that when we talk about the enhanced uh, partnership and cooperation agreement, um, 
we're talking about a harmonization of legislation. At the end of the day, we're talking about, <coughs> Boris before mentioned, um, renewable energy. So when we look at a trade agreement like that, we have to look at it slightly differently than the typical trade agreement that we would have with a country like the Ukraine or with a country like, for example, Turkey, the enhanced customs union, reformed customs union, and so on. So the difference is primarily the fact that because Kazakhstan is within an agreement already within the, um, with Russia and with other countries um, within the, the spectrum of the Eurasian Economic Union, it makes it a little bit more difficult to have an enhanced trade agreement uh, that, that has the same levels of trade or, or free trade, as I would call it, as, uh, as, as other countries. So what's important to focus on when we look at uh, this specific uh, trade agreement with Kazakhstan is a regulatory harmonization which is occurring. Now why is it so important to regularize and harmonize uh, laws and, and, and legislation to the European acquis? Well, there are two reasons for that. Uh, number one, it's extremely important, for example, in sectors like Boris mentioned before, in renewables. Uh, in order to play at the world level field of renewable sustainability, circular economy, and all of these kind of, uh, obviously, uh, future policy components of energy, um, it's important to have a regulatory framework which is WTO standards plus. WTO standards are already a very good level, but you can go well beyond that. And these subcommittees which have been set up both within trade, both within energy and other sectors do exactly that. And they're ongoing between the EU and Kazakhstan, and I think will yield quite a lot of success. Um, the second reason is uh, maybe to take a neighboring or somewhat neighboring country, not exactly geographically neighboring country, but to look at Turkey. Um, Turkey, which shares a lot of culture with, uh, with Kazakhstan, there's a degree of linguistic similarity and so forth, and historic similarity. Uh, when you look at Turkey, especially between the years of uh, 2000, 2002 and 2013, and you look at the economic development which occurred, the boom which happened to Turkey, which basically turned Turkey uh, or, or, or help Turkey transit from a, I mean, at best, medium level income country to a, a truly developed country in economic terms, at least, um, with, with a manufacturing industry, with a defense industry, and, and you name it. The reason for that is because they align with the European key. And I think Kazakhstan's uh, new government is probably well aware of that. Sayasat, how important would you say the EPCA has been for businesses in Kazakhstan and maybe particularly looking forward for the reasons Samuel mentioned for the harmonization regions. I mean, is it something that businesses in Kazakhstan are viewing as a game changer? Uh, well, in general, let me just really quickly step back and in general say that EU has always been one of the key partners for Kazakhstan. At, at, at one of my trainings, as well as in ge geopolitics, uh, let me just give you a little, little bit of informal touch, given the multivectoral uh, policy we have in, in international relations. I was in Canada once, uh, visiting Canadian civil service institution, training institution, and I would ask them, so how are you doing in Canada? And they'd say, well, it's like sleeping in a bed with an elephant. Yeah? You have to always keep one eye open, meaning the US. So you would understand that you know, we're living in a quite interesting neighborhood. So you, know, so you got to keep both eyes really open. And uh, I think uh, there is quite interesting uh, opportunity now for European Union. Uh, you see three major forces shaping the balance of powers in the region was Russia, China, and in the US. And in the last decade, we've seen US retracting uh, from the region. And there's a quite uh, an interesting vacuum, you know, political and economical vacuum, which is now being really quickly filled in by, by Chinese. So I think uh, European Union has quite interesting now chance being the key uh, partner, one of these key partners, to have more, um, how do I put that, to, to fill in more space in terms of economic relations. So coming back to uh, ECBA, uh, I think, yes, it, it, it has now a chance to play a more active role. Why? Because one, re reason number one, uh, the businesses are really actively in Kazakhstan now are really actively seeking foreign investments. The, uh, the package in the last 10 years, we've seen some, uh, they were not easy 10 years, the last decade, economically for Kazakhstan and countries in the region. So government is being very active in, in uh, uh, 
giving in, uh, filling in, uh, pouring a lot of investments to, to boost economic activity, to, to support businesses and SMEs. But now it's quite clear that then on the other side there's a social package, there's social obligation, and there's this uh, wealth distribution problem. Uh, and Tokayev's administration is now giving a lot of focus on social issues. So businesses and SMEs are now actively seeking for other sources of uh, investments and foreign investments. FDI is seeing as the most, uh, you know, uh, key area where we can. Give more, we can get more support to do boosting economic activity. So I think there is a, uh, I think the ECBA and the European Union in general, uh, now there's got quite an interesting uh, window of opportunity to take a more active role in, in building up and strengthening relationships, uh, giving more investments. Another another interesting thing that was mentioned, one of the. Um, uh, things that have been changing in the region in the last five years, several years, is that the, the Central Asian Union, the Central Asian Corporation of these five, six countries in the region, which was not uh, very obvious and strong because of other reasons uh, in the last decades, now becoming more clear and now there's a shift to, to tightening economic and political ties between the countries in the region. So now we're talking not only about Kazakhstan and one of the most economically developed countries, we're talking about 70, 80 million people market, which is now becoming uh, you know, more real. Yeah, and there might be another, uh, apart from Eurasian economic unit, there might be a more a different economic reality in the region. And we've seen with uh, the, the, the new Uzbekistan uh, leadership in Uzbekistan and in Tajikistan and, and Kyrgyzstan and now in Kazakhstan, they've seen this, so there's this historic chance to reset the discrepancies, reset the tensions which were present in, in regional cooperation and, and kind of build up new reality. Yeah? So I think uh, European Union uh, will, it does have a chance in terms of countries and region, especially Kazakhstan, to take a more active role uh, to, uh, and I totally agree that Turkey is a good example for us. Uh, the standards, the, the, the industrial standards, uh, the regulated, regulatory frameworks which were incorporated from European countries give real, build a platform, a framework for countries shift, uh, you know, escaping from this middle income trap uh, and really becoming a developed country. So there is a clear intention now, clear understanding. We've uh, made our mistakes. The Dutch disease, the curse, the, the resources curse, it's all been there. It's, we, we made all the, the possible mistakes. Now there's a clear understanding of what to do and what not to do. Uh, and in a nutshell, I think that uh, the EU and Kazakhstan and countries in the region have now more, pra should aim to build more pragmatic, more deeper uh, relationships, both in economic and political fields. Boris, let me go to you for a final question before we wrap up, which is about next steps in this relationship. Um, what do you think is key to achieve in the next five years or things that could develop in the next five years after which you would deem the EU-Kazakhstan relationship a real success story? Um, we have a... Uh... I think to fully implement this new agreement. Uh, Kazakhstan is working on a roadmap, so they are taking it extremely seriously. I mean, all the legal uh, step and all the structural step that they have to, to, to take to, to implement this agreement. Um, so um, that's, that will be our, our task in the coming years. I mean, to, to really put into life this agreement, uh, which is still provisionally uh, in force because we, need, we wait uh, the last uh, ratification by one, one member state. And we have, a, a, let's say, a machinery of uh, fora to, uh, to do that. I mean, uh, the EPC has uh, expanded uh, the uh, fora where we can discuss very concrete issues in the field of customs, in the field of uh, energy, in the field of uh, um, environment, so really we can go down to very concrete, uh, pragmatic things. 
So uh, for me, the, 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 main, uh, the main objective, uh, the joint the mutual objective will be to, to, to fully realize the potential of, uh, of the EPCA. But we have also a lot of uh, homework to do. Uh, Kazakhstan and also us at the EU, I mean, to, to work together with Kazakhstan to implement all the provisions of, of, of the new agreement. Well, there's certainly a lot of areas to explore there. I'd like to thank all of our guests for a great discussion, both here in Brussels and in Kazakhstan. And also, thank you so much at home for watching.